Hi, this is Dr. Nishal, and in this video we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease and how to treat it naturally and effectively. And as always, this is an evidence-based channel. So what can you do right away uh, for this condition? There's two things I'd like to bring up first before I get into the major details of this video. Uh, two things. Firstly, sage. Yes, the spice that you cook, I mean the herb that you cook with, yep. Sage has actually been used in a clinical trial on patients with Alzheimer's disease, uh, and it was uh, quite effective in improving cognitive function. So this is one of the first things that you definitely want to start using in a larger quantity. Uh, secondly, uh, lemon balm. Lemon balm has also been used in a, uh, in a clinical trial against a placebo, which it outperformed, uh, and it improved cognitive function as well, and it also improved the symptom of agitation. Now, this is very important. However, there's a downside to taking lemon balm in that uh, it can hamper thyroid function uh, to a certain extent. Uh, it's actually used in some cases for treating hyperthyroidism by certain um, herbalists. Uh, so there's a very specific way to use it to avoid this uh, side effect, at least this, this effect of it. Uh, in addition to this, there's a few other things that can also help for this condition. One is the amino acid known as carnitine, L-carnitine, specifically acetyl-L-carnitine. Uh, it improves various aspects of neurological health and it's uh, responsible for uh, brain communication as well. However, it also has a negative impact on the thyroid, so please be careful to use this under a doctor's supervision, specifically a holistic physician's supervision. Uh, now let's get into the details about this condition and the potential causes and what can be done about it and what's been clinically proven. So the first thing I'd like to bring up is a topic uh, which you've probably heard of before and that is insulin resistance. Now believe it or not, uh, insulin resistance plays a huge role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Just go ahead and at the end of this video Google diabetes type 3 and see what comes up. Alzheimer's disease is now being called diabetes type 3 and uh, you'll actually see research on that based on the pathogenesis of the condition uh, we see that insulin resistance plays a huge role in it and how does it actually do that well there's various aspects to it look at what sugar does in the body when it's uh, in the blood uh, excess sugar in the blood what is it what what happens it causes the arteries to become stiff uh, it causes cellular death degeneration and uh, is it going to do the same thing in the brain? Absolutely, it's going to do it everywhere it goes. That's how you get uh, diabetic uh, gangrene. That's how you get diabetic um, uh, neuropathy, retinopathy. It's because of damage to those organs and to the, the uh, supply of blood and nourishment to those organs. Uh, so insulin resistance is very important here. Also, insulin itself uh, inhibits a process in the body known as autophagy. Now, why is autophagy important for Alzheimer's? Well, you see those little plaques that build up in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's? They call them beta amyloid plaques. Where do they come from? We know that they're neurotoxic. We know that they play a huge role in the development and the symptoms of Alzheimer's. But where do they come from? Plaques like that are basically clumps of protein. And clumps of protein come, as, come out from the cells as cellular waste. And this waste is usually cleared out with the process known as autophagy. And when this doesn't happen, these clumps of protein just collect in the body. So insulin is what inhibits this process. There's a hormone that's opposite of insulin known as glucagon, and that is what induces this process. So getting insulin under, under control, insulin resistance under control is absolutely important. So what works and what has been used in clinical studies that also improves uh, brain function that would be a mineral known as chromium. Chromium improves insulin sensitivity, right? So in insulin resistance, the insulin sensitivity has gone down and the cells can't interact with the hormone known as insulin. Well, chromium enhances this. And chromium has been used in a clinical study in elderly patients who are at risk of neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, and it improved their um, uh, cerebral function, the cognitive cerebral fu function, and it uh, showed a lot of promise for that. So I personally always recommend or always look at chromium as the first option for solving this problem in these specific patients. However, this is kind of subjective in that other, other patients respond better to other things, such as uh, another option for this is AMLA. AMLA is actually a fruit, but it's actually outperformed several pharmaceutical drugs for multiple conditions, one of which was uh, for high blood sugar. 
and uh, I'll post a link to the studies for both chromium and AMLA. Uh, but there are other things as well apart from this, uh, such as intermittent fasting. Sometimes we have to combine uh, things like this. Now, intermittent fasting is basically where you don't eat for a certain period of time and then you eat in a small window, like you sleep for eight hours, right? And then you add another four, five, six hours at least, 14 hours where you shouldn't eat. Uh, so total, you don't eat for like 14 hours and then you do eat during a period of about eight hours. That's the basics of intermittent fasting. You can learn more about it online. There's plenty of information. And uh, so that's something else that improves insulin sensitivity. So there's these, these three common uh, options. There's a lot more than that in some cases where diabetes is uncontrolled uh, and, it, and blood sugar is really, really uh, out of range. Uh, and even in the case of uh, diabetes type 1, there are options, ways for the body to produce more insulin. But let's not get into that. Let's stay on topic here. So uh, insulin resistance is one of the key players here uh, for the development of this condition. So it's something that you definitely want to target. Uh, the next thing is slightly uh, controversial, but the evidence points toward it being an actual problem here. And that's heavy metals, specifically aluminum. Uh, the buildup of aluminum in the body and in the brain. Uh, now, doctors argue this and some say that, yeah, it plays a role. Some people say it doesn't play a role. My suggestion is whether it does play a role or not in this condition, why not get rid of it anyways? We don't want to wait 10 years down the line and realize that this was a huge problem that we completely ignored. Uh, let's just get rid of it. If the treatment for getting rid of it is not going to have any negative effects on you, why not do it anyways? So there are ways to get rid of heavy metals from the body, one of which is chlorella. And uh, this works quite well in my experience. Uh, so uh, how does heavy metals actually cause a problem? Well, there's lots of theories, one of which is inflammation. And inflammation tends to be the biggest issue when it comes to chronic illnesses, specifically degenerative conditions. Uh, the way in which the brain degenerates is through a process known as neuroinflammation. So anything that contributes to that, we need to eliminate. There are also ways to bring down neuroinflammation. I'll discuss that in a, in a moment. The next thing that causes um, yeah, Alzheimer's disease that was actually in the news today, which is why I'm doing this video, uh, is the herpes virus. There's actually been some evidence that has been uh, released today uh, suggesting scientists have suggested, or at least they have found a, a connection between the herpes virus and the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now this opens a whole new branch of therapeutics that we have to look at uh, because antiviral treatment was something that we didn't even know we had to think about in this condition. So obviously I have uh, no experience in using antivirals for the purpose of treating Alzheimer's because it's brand new information. So what would I use though? My first choice is going to be licorice root. Now a lot of people are against licorice root and the reason why is because they think it's going to take up their blood pressure. Here's the thing, here's what you need to know. If you are already hypertensive, yes, licorice root can have an impact on your blood pressure. If you are not hypertensive, you have to take a very large dose of licorice root over the period of several days, weeks actually, for it to actually impact your blood sugar, uh, I mean your blood pressure. And I say this not based on things I've read on the internet. I say this based on my own clinical experience and my own clinical training. Uh, if you look at uh, the evidence for licorice root and brain disorders, there's, there's actually a lot of evidence pointing towards the benefits of licorice root for the brain. Uh, I'll post a few of those studies in the description as well so you can take a look at it uh, in, in cases where it's improved brain function in children as well as in adults. Uh, so uh, that's talking about the viral thing. A few other antivirals uh, like um, elderberry is an antiviral, garlic is an antiviral as well. <clears throat> so these are other things that you can look into uh, for uh, targeting this, this aspect of the illness. Uh, so let's talk about the neuroinflammation topic that I brought up. Uh, neuroinflammation is basically inflammation in the brain and uh, it's how the disease progresses. It's through the inflammatory process. So what can be done to inhibit it? What is showing most promise right now is curcumin, which is uh, one of the uh, key constituents, chemical constituents found in a spice known as turmeric, which is used in, in um, Southeast Asia. Now, curcumin is showing a lot of promise for the brain and is something that I use with a lot of patients uh, for inflammatory conditions in general. Uh, so it's something that you can use as well under a doctor's supervision, of course. Uh, you can also consume more turmeric in your diet. 
uh, make sure that you always combine it with a bioavailability enhancer. What is that? Uh, there are several things that can enhance bioavailability. The most commonly known one is uh, black pepper, specifically the, the alkaloid found in it known as piperin. Uh, that's used for enhancing uh, bioavailability, but they are actually a ton of other bioavailability enhancers. In fact, licorice root, which we spoke about, is also a bioavailable, bioavailability enhancer. Uh, ginger is my preferable one because ginger in experimental studies has been linked to a reduction in neuroinflammation. That's because of two chemicals found in ginger. One is known as 10 gingerol and one is known as 6 uh, shogol. In addition to this, another spice also helps for neuroinflammation, at least in experimental studies. That's cinnamon. Cinnamon contains cinnamaldehyde, which has also been linked to a reduction in neuroinflammation. So that's a very important thing to look at as well. Getting more of these spices into your diet, uh, specifically turmeric and possibly supplementing with curcumin as well. Uh, so uh, that covers neuroinflammation basics of course there is more to it but uh, there's only so much I can fit into <laughs> these videos uh, the next thing I like to talk about is uh, the diet and nutrition uh, so in the case of any neuro de neurodegenerative condition the first thing we want to look at is the amount of healthy fats in the diet because the brain is predominantly made up of fatty acids so you need to be eating as much of those as well so I'm talking about foods like avocados, nuts and seeds, eggs, and, and there are tons of options for this. You can supplement with fatty acids as well, uh, but following a diet such as the ketogenic diet can have a lot of benefits uh, as long as you include in certain types of vegetables like cruciferous vegetables. Uh, and uh, the ketogenic diet is something that can definitely help. Uh, theoretically, there are other things, other aspects to this as well, such as B vitamins. You see, in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's, we see that chemicals in the brain play a huge role as well. Specifically, two chemicals: one is known as um, uh, acetylcholine, and the second one is known as glutamate. These are neurotransmitters in the brain, and they play a very important role in brain function overall. So, what we what is typically done in patients with Alzheimer's disease is they are put on drugs known as acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And so what that does is it inhibits the enzyme that breaks down this uh, neurotransmitter. So what you can actually do is to get more of this neurotransmitter is to supplement your body with the raw materials for building it, uh, which would be choline. That's uh, vitamin B4. Choline is a B vitamin and can be supplemented with. Um, there's also certain things that inhibit acetylcholinesterase in natural medicine as well. There's, it's more based on experimental studies, of course. Uh, however, those uh, drugs, I mean, well, here we call them supplements. Uh, they also improve memory in clinical studies. So uh, the clinical studies kind of support the experimental studies. Uh, but for that, you need to speak to an Ayurvedic doctor. Uh, the other neurotransmitter that plays a role here is glutamate, and uh, the evidence suggests that this neurotransmitter tends to be uh, overly um, excessive in the, in the body or excessive in its function uh, in terms of overstimulation of the central nervous system and specific pathways. Uh, so what we typically do here is we give vitamin B6 because this facilitates the conversion of glutamate into GABA, gamma amino butric acid and that actually calms down the central nervous system uh, so b vitamins are very important for this condition as well as uh, getting more healthy uh, fats into your diet because the the brain is built made up of, of fatty acids think about it this way if your muscles were degenerating or were getting smaller what would you do you'd eat more protein right because the muscles are made up of protein well if your your brain was degenerating what would you eat fats because the brain is made up of fatty acids, right? So it's uh, very important. Anyways, I hope this information helped you and uh, or helped you. And uh, as always, uh, you can get in touch with me through my website. I do online consultations for patients all over the world. Uh, all the information is on my website, drnishal.com. And uh, I will see you in the next video.